better be the best if they devote backwardness. Brothers better be the best if they conquer a beautiful bigness. And I comprehend that bad is only bad if it's big, black, and better than boastful practice. Be little in our best and brightest when boss is seeking inches and our minds are better. Brothers need to stop and bop to be in black and bright and above board. The black train of beautiful wisdom that has been in this bind to a new and knowledgeable beginning that is bountiful and bountiful and beautiful. While be bopping to be better than the test, brother man, better yet, write the exam. <laughs> So, but when I was your age and I was trying to become a poet, and I'm in high school writing poetry, all right? And at that time, you can't be a poet and be a man, all right? That's what I'm telling you, okay? So I'm sitting in high school, this is Dunbar High School, writing my poems, and the brothers come up behind me and say, hey, Don, what you doing, man? I'm writing lyrics for the Four Tops. Uh. <laughs> I'm writing lyrics for the Temptations, all right? That's what I tell them. <laughs> so this, is, this poem came out of something like that in terms of just trying to do this poet's work, okay? And this would be, I'm going to read this poem, then one other, and then take your questions. Poet, whatever happened to Luther? My name used to be Don L. Lee. The, and, the L stands for Luther. Poet, whatever happened to Luther? He was strange weather, this Luther. He read books, mainly poets, and sometimes long books about people in foreign places. For a young man, he was too serious. He never did smile. And the family stood over here had good teeth. He liked music, too. He even tried to play the trumpet until he heard the young Miles Davis. He then said he tried writing. The family didn't believe him because there ain't never no writers in this family. And everybody knows that whatever you end up doing, it's got to be in your blood. It's like loving women. It's in the blood, arteries, and brains. This family don't even write letters. They call everybody. That's why the phone's off six months out of the year. <laughs> then again, his brother, Willie T, used to write long, long letters from prison about the books he was reading from Malcolm X and Franz Fanon and George Jackson and Richard Wright and others. Unlike his brother, Luther didn't smoke or drink. And he always been doing odd jobs to get money. Even his closest friend, Clyde and T-Bone, didn't fully understand him. While they'd be partying all weekend, Luther would be traveling. He'd be taking his little money with a bag full of food, many food, and a change of underwear, and get on a Greyhound bus and go. He said he'd be visiting cities. Yet the real funny thing about Luther was his ideas. He was always talking about Africa and black people. He was into that black stuff. And he was as light-skinned as a piece of golden corn in the car. <laughs> He'd be calling himself black and African and upsetting everybody, especially white people. They'd be calling him crazy, but not to his face. Anyway, the family, man, mainly the educated side, they just left him alone. And uh, every child of God knows that when family members act polite, that means they don't want to be around you. It didn't matter much, because after his mother died, he left the city, went into the army. The last time we heard from him was in 1963. He got put out of the army for rioting. He disappeared somewhere between Mississippi and Chicago. A third cousin, who family members also was polite to her, got, appeared one day and said that Luther had grown a beard and changed his name and stopped eating meat. She said he had been to Africa and now lived in Chicago doing what he wanted to do, writing books. She also said that he smiled a lot and kind of got good teeth. <laughs> Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Sonia Sanchez said, well, I can't, you know, you got to ask for a woman also. <laughs> I'm going to end up here with uh, art. Thank you for your kindness, and for those of you who stayed, thank you for staying. Um, art saved my life, and art can save your life. I was a poet, the written word, fiction writer, 
Art is important. Art is bodhijas, your primary energy force. Children's active participation in music, dance, painting, poetry, film, photography, <laughs> and the indigenous craft of their people is what makes them whole, significantly human, secure their own skin, culture, and abilities, generating them unlimited possibilities. Art is fundamental instruction and a food for a people's soul as they translate the many languages and acts of becoming, often telling them in no uncertain terms that all humans are not pure or perfect. However, the children of all cultures inherit their creator's capacity to originate from the bone of their imaginations, the closest manifestations of purity, perfection, and beauty. Art, at its best, encourages us to walk on water, dance on top of trees, and skip from star to star without being able to swim, keep a beat, or fly. A child's on fire imagination is the one prerequisite for becoming an artist. Just want to stop you. Thanks for coming out, brother. Thanks for coming out. It's so important to uh, appreciate the elders among us. It is so important that these brothers and these sisters, they laid the foundation for us. They built this university. That's why we're here. And so just end up with these last two stanzas. I need your help on this one, though. So I, I ended up with I ended up the last stanza that, that, that art, a child's on fire imagination, is the one universal prerequisite for becoming an artist. So I'm going to ask you to help me. So magnify your children's mind with art. You say art. Right. Jumpstart their questions with art. Right. Introduce your children to the cultures of the world through art. Right. Right. Come on. Energize their young feet, spirits, and souls with art. Right. Infuse the values important to civic culture via art. Right. Right. Keep them curious, political, and creative with art. Right. Right. Speak and define the universal language of beauty with art. Right. Right. Learn to appreciate peace with art. Right. Approach the other cultures of other people through their art. Right. Right. Introduce the spiritual path for other people through their art. Right. Keep young people in school off drug and out of prison with art. Right. Right. Keep their young minds running, jumping, and excited with art. Right. Right. Examine the nurturing moments of love, peace, and connecting differences with art. Right. Art right. allows and encourages the love of self and others. The best artists are not mass murderers, criminals, or child molesters. They're the beauty and creation business. Art is elemental to intelligence. Intelligence work in democracy, freedom, equality, and justice. Art, if used wisely and widely, early and often, is an answer and a question. It is a cultural lake that indigenous rivers of dance, music, local images, and voices flow. Art is the waterfall of life, reflecting the untimely and unique soul of a people. Art is the drumbeat of good and great hearts for the seeking peace and a grand future for all enlightened peoples. For these are the people of the world over who lovingly and lovingly proclaim, give the artist some kind words, financial support, guesses from the heart, knowing intuitively that they will be creative reciprocity in all that they give us. Why? Because fundamentally, art inspires, informs, directs, generates hope, and challenges the receiver to respond. And finally, and this is consequential, the quality of the art determines the quality of the responses. Thank you very much.
you have questions, I'll, I'll try to take them. I know some of you got to leave, and I respect you for staying uh, this this long. I apologize for going over. But you know, you give you give a port of the microphone, and you know, it's like strawberry. <laughs> uh, yes, my name is Gregory Sexton. Uh, Senior history major. Uh, one question I have for you is uh, when you. What made what made you choose Chicago of all cities? Chicago, more than my choosing it, it chose me. What happened, young young brother, is that when my mother died, I was 16, and my father lived in Chicago, and so. My sister, with her first child, about to have a second child, she ended up staying in Detroit with my father's parents. But that wouldn't work for me. So I decided to go and live with a stranger who was my father. That lasted approximately six months when he decided he wanted to try to put his hands on me. And coming from the streets, and he had no idea of who I was, because he had not helped my mother in any way to raise the two of us, I wasn't going to stand for the stranger hitting me. And so I left home, I was close to 17, moved into the YMCA, and finished high school. Home. So Chicago was comfortable because it had one of the largest black populations in the country. And I knew war was coming. I knew the 60s was on us. And when Malcolm was murdered, King was murdered, Megan was murdered, you know war was hitting the streets. And I felt more comfortable in Chicago than any place else. That's why I stayed. And that's why we build those institutions there in Chicago. Yes, sir. Uh, so my name is Gabriel Smith. I'm also a senior history major here. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you think the, uh, I guess, the images of black men that have been portrayed in uh, media, like, how do you think uh, we can overcome that? Because, you know, not all black men are, you know, in rap music videos. Not all black men are athletes. You know, there's people like, you know, the gentleman here, you know, like myself and these others that are here in school trying to do, you know, Actually, high. son, most black men, black men that you see, most of them. All right. See, what happens, less than 25% are portrayed because of mass media. See, mass media do not want to portray us as being responsible. All right. Mass media is basically controlled by white men, not even white women, white men. You see? And the greatest threat to white male rule would be black male or brown male or women and men ruling. You see what I'm saying? White people are less than 8%, what, 9% of the world's population. Think about this. White people are less than 9% of the world's population. How did they get where they are now? The indigenous people in America didn't invite them here. They got lost coming in and found all this and came in committing genocide after genocide. Especially since you're all history majors, you need to read The Destruction of Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams. The Destruction of Black, we published it. All right. The Destruction of Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams. You read anything by John Henry Clark, we published a couple of his books also. You go to thirdworldpressbooks.com. Right. And so you're, you will be an example. You will be an example. That's why I said earlier, you don't let nobody tell you what you can't do. And so if you're a history major and you want to stay in this field, it requires a PhD. If you want to teach, it requires a PhD. You come through here, add an undergraduate, go on and get your master's. But generally what happens, if you're coming through here with a 4.0, you should be able to get a free ride at any major research one. Right. And generally, if you go into the right research one for a PhD, they're going to combine the PhD and the master's degree. Right. But it takes a little bit longer for history. Right. 
somewhere between five and seven years. It depends upon where you go. But it is a worthy goal. It is a worthy goal. And I would encourage both of you to do that. But no, that's not you. Go ahead. Yes, yes ma'am. Let me just, uh, before you, let me just make an announcement. Uh, copies of three of Professor Von Booty's books are available for purchase in the foyer and uh, immediately after we adjourn, he will be available in the foyer. So. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Hello, Christine Bonnet, the book of science major, graduating senior. Um, given your background and how you grew up, thank you for being so candid, by the way. Um, and today with our rappers, they're singing so loud about um, how the only people with money are the drug dealers and the gangbangers. What was it that made you decide to go a different route when for so many young men, it's so easy for them to fall into that trap? And what would, you, what would be your advice for them today? I think that um, seeing my mother um, as beautiful as she was, being destroyed. I left a lot out of that story. I'm not going to go into it now, but I was so sensitive and so and loved my mother so much. And then seeing my sister's life almost duplicate my mother's life. And so I've always been had this this desire to um, to really do that which is good, just correct and right. Good, just correct and right. That's it. And I've always felt that I've been, you know, very fortunate in what Christians would say blessed 